Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar run by Southern and Tropical Beef Technology Services. My name is Philip Mann and joining me tonight as usual is Andrew Byrne who will be your main presenter. Tonight's webinar is titled The Newer EBVs and Incorporation of DNA into Breed Plan. And this is the final webinar in the sixth webinar course titled uh, Breed Plan from Go to Woe. As with our previous webinars, Andrew will be talking through the presentation that will come up on your screen. We encourage you as always to submit any questions that you may have related to tonight's topic. Uh, and you can do this by typing your questions into the question field, which is located toward the bottom of the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. Once you've entered your question, simply click on the send button and hopefully that will come through to us. Uh, we will be stopping periodically throughout the presentation to answer the questions that you have. Uh, as we have a lot to get through tonight, we may not be able to answer all of your questions, uh, but I will be providing a list of, the, of staff at the end of the presentation that can be contacted to provide a response. If your question box should disappear at any stage, just click on the double arrows at the top left of your control panel to get it back. I'll now hand over to Andrew to take you through tonight's presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip, and good evening, everybody. Um, as uh, Philip discussed in his introduction there, tonight we will be discussing some of the newer EBVs. Uh, all the EBVs we're going to talk about tonight are considered, I guess, trial EBVs, so um, they're, they're still in a, a trial kind of period and are open to change as we go along, as opposed to some of the EBVs um, that we've discussed in previous weeks. The offshoot of that is they may not be available in all breeds, or they, they will not be available in all breeds, and um, so they may only apply to members from, from certain breeds. The EBVs we're going to discuss um, are the flight time EBVs, the shear force EBVs, structural soundness EBVs, and net feed intake EBVs. Now how I plan to handle this is we'll just discuss these one by one. We'll go through and discuss what the EBV means, then have a chat about what information you need to collect should you wish to consider having these EBVs um, calculated for your animals. Um, also a brief discussion on some of the considerations you need to make when recording this information. So we'll discuss these first four, or these EBVs um, first of all, and then towards the completion of the webinar we'll go through and discuss what's happening with the incorporation of DNA information into breed plan. So we've got a fair bit to get through tonight, um, but as Philip said, I'd really encourage you to ask your questions as we go along. We'll break periodically and try and address most of those. So the, the first EBV um, which we'll discuss tonight is the flight time EBV. Um, flight time EBVs are currently available in uh, the Brahmin breed and also in the Santa Gertrudis breed. Um, in the case of Santa Gertrudis, they're still just within herd EBVs, uh, but members of both of those breeds can currently get EBVs calculated for flight time. The EBV provides differences between animals in in flight time um, and to give you a definition as to what flight time is you can see in the picture there towards the bottom uh, we have two light beams set up at the um, exit to a crush and effectively flight time is measuring the time it takes for an animal to cross those two light beams um, and we'll discuss uh, a little bit more exactly as to how to measure this in the, in the next few slides but the EBV itself is expressed in seconds um, and effectively there what we're looking at is animals with higher flight time EBVs or have a, a higher flight time so they take a longer time to cover the distance between those two light beams uh, more favourable being associated with better temperament. Um, so the animals obviously that are a bit stirry will fly out of the crush and cover that uh, distance quite quickly. Importantly, as, as well as being a good measure of temperament, the flight time EBV has also shown to be genetically correlated with meat tenderness, so some improved meat quality, um, and we're, we're now looking, particularly in the Bos Indicus breeds, um, as using flight time as a potential way of indirectly measuring uh, things like meat tenderness to therefore make improvements um, in those particular traits. Uh, the other thing that it's also been shown to be correlated with is animals with um, superior flight time themselves 
have also been shown to have improved feedlot performance, uh, daily weight gain and also less weight loss during transport. So the, the theory is that that's due to their uh, association with a better temperament, therefore handling the stresses of transport and slaughter and feedlot and those things uh, better than other animals. So that's the EBV. Um, if you're interested in uh, calculate or having flight time EBVs calculated on your animals, um, the information that you can record here are these flight time measurements. Um, so effectively you, you need to use the, the proper equipment. Um, so we can see we've got a, a bit better uh, picture here of the actual equipment. You've got the exit of the crush and there's a light beam set up just at the exit to the crush. Then f just a little bit further on, another 1.8 to 2 metres further on, uh, there's another light beam. That's all hooked up to a computer screen um, and the actual equipment measures the time it takes for the animal to leave the crush. So we're measuring this information generally on young animals, so um, around uh, weaning through, through to yearlings, but we'll discuss that in a bit more detail in a second. So if you're interested in having the, the flight time EBVs calculated on your animals in Brahman and, and Santa Gertrudis, you need to collect this, this information um, and send that in to, to breed plan. If you're in the other breeds, um, really we're probably in a bit of a data collection stage at the moment. Once there's sufficient information, uh, either for your herd or for the breed, then those EBVs can be calculated on your animals. Uh, but at this stage, there, there's nothing that, that's currently calculated. Um, so some considerations when you're recording flight time. Um, the first consideration you need to make is you obviously need to use the, the proper flight time machines. Now, there's a, a number of different places you can get these machines from. Um, we at SBTS and TBTS have uh, a couple of machines which we can send out to you. Um, the, the Beef CRC also have a few machines and I think some of the, the Department of Agriculture have some of the machines. The easy way, I guess, if you're interested in it, is to contact staff at Breed Plan. Um, just probably around four to six weeks before you plan to take these measurements, and um, they can organise the equipment for you or, or put you in the right direction anyway. Um, the second thing, consideration when you need to, when you're looking at recording flight time, is you need to record the information before animals have had significant handling. The reason for that is that you might get differences in their actual flight time due to differences between the, the previous handling that they've had. Um, I guess the, the classic case may be animals that have been uh, broken to be prepared for shows versus animals who have just been running out of the paddock and haven't had much handling at all. Obviously you might expect uh, some difference there in, in the flight time measurements. So it's important to record um, the information before they've had significant handling um, and the recommendation would be at weaning, uh, although for practicality some people are doing it out to, to yearling age in around 400 days and that's shown to also have been very useful information. Um, what I should say there is if there are animals that have had a significant difference in the amount of handling that they have received of the animals that you've measured on the one day, you do have the option to submit a management group uh, just to clearly identify those differences. When you're recording the information, it's important to, to use a consistent method and the same handlers. So um, when, you, when you're doing a mob, it's just important to do it in a consistent manner. Um, for recommendations probably there are to maybe give the animals a run through just the, if they haven't been through that race and, and crush before, um, just give them a run through beforehand just so they become familiar with I guess the way out um, so you don't get animals balking and those type of things and differences just due to that uh, kind of error. So uh, a dry run can, can be useful. Um, and then obviously uh, making sure you're doing everything the same way, you've got the same people putting the cattle through the yards um, and then you won't get any differences due to those kind of things. Uh, as I've already said, if there are differences between animals in the amount of handling they've had prior uh, to, to measurement, you do have the option to record management groups and that's, that's very important as with all the performance information you're sending into breed plan to be acting as the eyes for the breed plan analysis. Um, and in terms of this, where you send this information once you've collected it, you need to send that information off to breed plan. So uh, exactly the same kind of process as what you would with your weights information or your carcass information. You can send it in either through the, the electronic means that are available through herd recording programs or the Microsoft, uh, I think we can put it into a Microsoft Excel template. Um, 
you won't be able to use the internet submission facility at the moment because it won't be set up for it, uh, but you also have some paper options to send that in. So uh, they're the kind of considerations you need to make when recording the, the flight time. Um, we'll move to the, the next EBV now, uh, the Shear Force EBV. Um, so the Shear Force EBV, we, we talked about flight time being used as an indirect measure um, of meat tenderness. Basically the shear force EBV uh, is providing you with genetic differences between animals in meat tenderness. So it's expressed as differences in the kilograms of shear force uh, that are required to pull a mechanical blade uh, through a piece of meat. So that's I guess the objective way that they use to, to measure meat tenderness. They take a meat sample um, and they try and pull a mechanical blade through it and measure the kilograms of force that are required to, to pull that blade through it. So I guess what they're trying to, to measure there is a similar thing to the amount of effort that may be required to, to chew a piece of steak. So in this case obviously lower more negative EBVs would be more favourable, so lower EBVs would indicate less force required to, to pull that mechanical blade through the piece of meat and therefore higher meat tenderness. I guess with, with all these uh, flight time and shear force and the other trial EBVs, if you're not sure as to which direction you should be selecting on these EBVs, the name often gives it away. So with the flight time EBVs, um, obviously the higher flight time, the, the, the more time taken to cover those two light beams, so that would be the more favourable. In the case of shear force, um, the lower EBVs or the less shear force would indicate more meat tenderness and hence be the, the most favourable way. If you're interested in um, having shear force EBVs calculated on your animals, at the moment the shear force EBVs are only calculated for the Brahmin breed, um, so that's, that's the first limitation, but in other breeds if there's sufficient information calculated then or, or put on, onto the databases then we potentially can calculate shear force EBVs for those animals. Uh, the information that you can collect, uh, there are three different sources of that information. Obviously. Um, the, the direct actual measurement of this trait are shear force measurements. So we take a meat sample and we put it through uh, meat laboratory and actually put it through the shear force machine and measure the amount of shear force. So that's the, the direct information. In a practical sense if you're trying to select size, obviously we, we can't take a meat sample from those animals and send it into the laboratory to get those measurements. So the shear force measurements tend to come from progeny trials um, where we might generate some steer progeny uh, from a couple of sires, put them through uh, the test and collect those meat samples and actually take those measurements. So that's the direct performance. The other information though that, that you can send into it is the flight time information. So what we've just previously discussed, there's a good correlation there I think of around 0.3 um, between flight time and meat tenderness. So um, in, in that manner we you can take flight time measurements both for the flight time EBV but importantly to, to feed into the shear force EBVs. And the other important bit of information which we can collect is some of the DNA information. So at the moment the Pfizer uh, MVPs for tenderness plus also their previous star measurements are feeding in to the calculation of the trial shear force EBVs for the Brahmin breed. So there's three different sets of information. I guess if you're, you're looking at having shear force EBVs calculated, I'd be recommending that you consider that the DNA tests, you look at taking flight time measurements and then you see if there's any way that you can get actual shear force measurements on the animals or on their progeny. This information um, it always all need to be needs to be submitted to breed plan uh, directly. So there's nothing going to your breed societies in, in this manner. Um, the there, there are a number of different ways of getting that in there. I guess if you're looking at it, then contact staff at breed plan to, to work out the best way of sending that information in. Um, most of the DNA tests, I believe, will, will generally be set up so that they should automatically flow from Pfizer uh, through onto the breed society databases. But I'd be, uh, if you're interested in it, then I'd be making sure that the information that you have sent into Pfizer does get on the breed society databases, because sometimes that uh, system does break down. Uh, so that's uh, the first two EBVs. Um, I might uh, throw back to Philip now, and we'll look at some questions that have come in. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Got a few questions there. Um, 
Firstly, in relation to, to flight time recording, um, one question we have there is, uh, are animals restrained in the crush for any specific, specific period before exiting for recording? Uh, my, my understanding is they're certainly not put in the head bale, so the, the crush is just closed in front of them, and they're just standing in the crush. Um, my understanding is there's no specific period, it's just enough to, to, to stop them, and then so that they're stopped in the crush, then it's opened and, and they leave. Um, so they go through fairly quickly from, from what I understand, um, and there's certainly no, as far as I'm aware, defined period of time that we look at. I'm not sure if you've got anything further to add to that, Philip. You've had a bit more experience with flight time. Yeah, I guess here is the, the main thing you touched on it before is just to be consistent with what you're doing. So if um, if you are holding an animal in the in the crush for anything else, um, like weighing or or vaccinating or anything like that, you make sure you're doing it for the for the whole group of animals that you're you're recording and not just um, individuals within the group. Um, another question we have there is um, in terms of the the light beam spacing out at the exit of the crush, um, why not just use two metres as there is a great difference between 1.8 and two metres? Uh, my understanding is that it, it, because we're only comparing animals within you know, the same measurement day type of, as long as all the animals at the same distance is used, it doesn't make too much difference whether it's exactly 1.8 metres or, or two metres, it's just generally in that kind of um, distance, then we get good ranking of animals and consistent ranking of animals. So um, you, you're certainly not, if you've got your, your set up at 2 metres and um, your neighbour's got it set up at 1.8, there'll be no direct comparison of those uh, measures, so uh, there'll be no biases coming to the system there. It's just a, there's just a little bit of range which is allowed to collect the, the same useful information. Okay. Um, another question we have is, can we measure can we measure flight time without the equipment? Um, that is, can we just give it a, a like a slow, a medium, and a fast uh, measurement just on a subjective uh, recording? Yeah, at the moment, uh, the answer is no. Um, I guess with all these these trial EBVs, if there was work done in that area that showed that that information was useful or um, effective enough, then that's possibly the, the case. But at the moment, it needs to be. Um, both uh, objective measurement, so exactly the number of seconds, and I, I didn't say before, to two decimal places, um, so that the machines will measure it to either one or two decimal places, you, you can do it to either or, um, but at the moment it needs to be defined equipment. Okay, thanks. Um, the last question we had there on flight time was, uh, last week we were talking about docility EBVs and, and use of crush, crush scoring to, to go into the calculation of that. Uh, the question is, why why not use crush score instead of flight time? A very, very good question. Um, I guess we, when we're looking at temperament or, or docility, um, there, are, there are two options that you have. The subjective scores um, have were shown with the docility EBVs to do a very good job and have got a, a similar, if not better, heritability um, than the flight time measurements. So if, if your real objective, I guess, is to improve temperament, then I, I would be suggesting that the docility scores are perfectly adequate and in a lot of cases they're, they're far more practical to measure because we don't have to get machines out to everybody and, and go through the, the practical limitations of that. So the, the main benefit I think of flight time as well as its impact on temperament is also its ability to indirectly improve meat tenderness. So. Um, there is some potential to do that through docility EBVs, but I think it's, there's more to it than that. So um, actually taking the flight time measurements has been shown, I think, to be a really good way of actually improving the meat tenderness side of things, and that's why the, the Brahmins and the Santa Gertrudis breeds are persevering down that track. Yeah, I guess just another point on that, Andrew, too. I guess in the extensive, more extensive situations, it probably uh, potentially could be a bit quicker. To, to do flight time recording as opposed to a, um, a crash wall recording. Um, just on the uh, shear force EBV, the uh, question is how many direct shear force measurements would be needed to enable a trial EBV to be calculated? Okay, um, I, in a breed that doesn't have them, um, 
not a hundred percent sure what we'd be looking at. I think we'd be looking at possibly a, a couple of thousand to, to get EBVs calculated, uh, but we'd have to discuss that with um, the, the scientists at Agbu. In a, a breed such as uh, Brahmin, where there's already shear force information there, and we're talking about direct shear force measurements now, um, it has a similar heritability of the weight traits, as I understand, so um, you wouldn't need too many measurements to actually calculate a trial EBV on certain animals. Okay, thanks Andrew. That's all the questions we have for now, so yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Okay, thank you Philip. Um, so the, the next EBVs that we'll look at are the structural soundness EBVs. So the structural soundness EBVs um, are only available at the moment in the Angus breed, um, but other, a number of other breeds are currently looking at those, and once there's sufficient information there, then certainly that they may be calculated in those breeds. Uh, the, the structural EBVs, they are available or just recently been put onto the actual EBV inquiry system on the Angus Australia kind of database search. So um, if you're looking at uh, any Angus bulls or you want to have a look at what these EBVs look like, uh, you'll find them on that EBV inquiry system. So the, the structural soundness EBVs are giving us differences but, or expected differences in progeny or the, the percentage of progeny which will have acceptable structure for five uh, different traits of economic and functional importance. So there's five different structural soundness EBVs. The, the higher the EBVs are, the, or the more positive EBVs, they indicate animals which will have a greater percentage of progeny with a desirable score for that particular structural trait. So in this case that the higher EBVs indicate higher structural soundness. Um, for expected differences in the progeny from those particular animals. For animals which have very low EBVs, indicating a, a lower percentage of animals uh, or progeny with a desirable score, the nature of the structural fault is also identified. So um, we'll have a look at that when we have a look at the EBVs, but as well as having a low EBV, it also gives you an indication as to what the nature of that structural fault is or likely to be in their progeny. So the EBVs which we have, um, as I said, there are five of those calculated at the moment. Um, the first one is basically the, the front feet claw set EBVs. So it looks there at the shape um, and the evenness of the claw set in the front seat, on the, on the front um, feet. So we can look there between a, a score of, of one giving you that the animals have very open uh, kind of divergent claws on the front feet versus the score of nine being the scissor claw. So um, we, we've got an EBV relating to effectively the uh, differences in progeny which will, or difference in the percentage of progeny which will have an acceptable structure for front feet claws, a uh, claw set. Um, I guess the, when I said before that animals with lower EBVs, the nature of the fault will also be identified. So if you're looking at the, the front feet claw set EBV, um, if, it's, if it's very low EBV, it'll either come with an, an OD or an SC, indicating that yes, there's um, a structural fault, and in this case, that's because they're too open or because they're scissor claws. Uh, the next two EBVs relate to foot angle, um, so it's looking at the foot angle both in the front and the back feet, um, and effectively it's trying to evaluate the strength of paston, depth of heel and, and the length of the foot. Um, a, a score of one there obviously is indicating that the animals have a very steep foot angle versus a, a score of nine indicating they're fairly low in the pastons or fairly shallow. So. Um, that, they get two different EBVs relating to foot angle, both the front and the back, and the animals with the low EBVs will be indicated there with either an SA or an SH, depending on, on the nature of their fault. Um, the rear leg side view is the next one, so we, we move to some of the, the angles in the back legs, um, and effectively the, the rear leg side view is giving you the angles um, measured at the front of the hock. Uh, so a score of one there indicating the animals are, are very straight in the back legs versus a score of nine indicating that they're quite sickle hocked. Um, again, if they have um, a, a fault, then they'll either have an ST indicating they're straight or sickle hocked, um, an SI. 
The last one is the, the hind view on the rear legs. Um, so it's, it's starting to look there as to whether they're bow-legged uh, with a score of one there through to being fairly cow-hocked out at a score of nine. Um, again, the different abbreviations which are used for, with these EBVs, so if, they're, if they're fairly low for this particular trait, um, is BL for bow-legged or CH for cow-hocked. So the EBVs, um, I guess I, I should point out, are not looking at the animal themselves, their own structure. It's looking at the, the differences which we would expect in the progeny um, if we use that particular bull. So differences in the percentage of progeny which would um, be expected to have uh, acceptable structure for those particular traits. Um, if you're interested in collecting information, um, then the EBVs at this stage are based on structural scores. So basically I, I, the scores were listed there for the different traits. They're all collected on a one to nine scale. At this stage, they do need to be collected by an accredited structural scorer. Um, there's a list of accredited structural scorers on the, the Breed Plan website. Uh, if you go to the Breed Plan website homepage and go into the technical area, there'll be a list of accredited structural scorers there in the same spot as where the accredited scanners are for, for the carcass traits. Um, in the past, they have looked in, in certain breeds at being breeders being able to collect this information themselves, uh, but unfortunately when they analyse the information uh, effectively, that it wasn't of sufficient uh, reliability to be able to generate EBVs from. So it, it had low repeatability and also a fairly low heritability. So at this stage we need accredited structural scorers to do it. Um, at, at this stage the Angus EBVs, the scores are taken on animals younger than 750 days. So that there's only animal, basically the, the information that's taken on the, the yearlings or the, the two-year-olds feeds into the analysis. There has been a, a range of different uh, mature cow herds kind of scored um, and they're looking at whether they can include that information in the analysis and when they actually looked at it, it did have a, a greater heritability so it showed that it was very useful information but at the moment only the information from young animals was feeding in. I guess in a practical sense, in a lot of cases, what people are doing is getting the structural scorer to, to take the scores at the same time as scanning. Most of the scanners tend to be um, also accredited structural scorers, so they're doing it when they're scanning, when they've still got the contemporary group of animals together. Um, by the time we get out to the mature cow, there's a lot of females that have dropped out of the system. So at this stage, it's just the young animals. Uh, there's only one set of scores at the moment on each animal that will feed into the analysis, so people are only scoring uh, animals once, and that information needs to be sent to breed plan. Now, um, you can do that electronically or the actual feedback sheet that you'll get from your accredited structural scorer will be sufficient to, to go into breed plan, so you can just send that off as long as you've got on that the full society ident of the animal, um, so it's properly identified, and I guess also any management group type of information that, that may be available as well if, if animals are being injured or those type of things uh, which may be causing differences in their actual structure scores. Uh, so that, they're the, the structure EBVs. Um, the next two EBVs we need to look at are the net feed intake EBVs. Uh, so there, there are two of these calculated. Uh, at the moment they're only calculated for the Angus and the Hereford breed. Um, the, what, what the EBVs are providing us with in this case is differences between animals in feed intake at a standard weight and rate of weight gain. So they're expressed as differences in the kilogram of feed intake per day when animals are adjusted for differences in weight and their rate of the weight gain. And in this case, the lower EBVs indicate lower net feed intake, so therefore animals which will eat less when at a similar weight and rate of weight gain and therefore be more favourable, so or indicate greater feed efficiency. Now there are two EBVs calculated as I said, the first one NFIF um, is providing us with differences between animals in net feed intake when they're in kind of a feedlot finishing phase, so they're, they're basically being finished 
Net feed intake P is still relating to the feedlot, but more when animals are in a growth phase uh, rather than in a feedlot finishing phase. So when, when they're younger animals and they're still relatively uh, growing more to, to putting on the fat cover. So those two EBVs, um, there's a fairly high correlation between them, obviously. Uh, I think the correlation is around 0.7, but they have shown that size do rank differently. Effectively, that the differences there are the different places where they were measured. So they showed that size did rank differently depending on whether their progeny had put into the, the Trangy um, feed test station, which was more in that post-weaning growth phase versus whether they, their progeny were put into Talimba, which were older animals and, and more in that feedlot finishing phase. So they do both relate to, to kind of uh, feed intake in a feedlot situation um, and obviously we, we're not sure at the moment as to exactly how that relates to maybe female feed efficiency on grass, uh, which is probably the, the very important trait um, for, for kind of commercial feed efficiency. Um, if you're interested in recording this information, then there are two different bits of information which goes into it. The, the primary information is the, the information which comes out of the, the feed intake trials. So um, animals go into these pens in, in specific test stations, uh, and the pens are between about 12 to 15 animals. Um, Every time they go on, you can, you can see the, the feed bin there. It weighs the animal. It also weighs the feed bin before. Um, they, they, they eat and also after, so it measures how much they eat. Uh, it's all done through electronic tags um, so that it, all the information is recorded. Um, they basically go in and, and go through a 21-day pre-adjustment period um, so they all get used to the setup and, and the feed and those type of things. And then there's a 70-day test, so they're in there for 70 days. Now obviously this is a, a fairly high-cost um, situation, so you're looking at uh, I'm not sure what the, the current kind of estimates of the cost are because it is very highly related to, to the grain prices, uh, but I think we're looking at the moment at around, or well, certainly over $300 to $400 per animal. So um, it, it's not cheap and that is probably put, well, it's the reason why the brakes have been put on this EBV. Uh, and, and I guess realistically, uh, in a commercial sense, not many individual breeders are collecting the, the feed intake information. Um, most of it's coming through structured progeny tiles that are being run by the, the breed societies um, or by, by large organisations. Um, Certainly this is one thing which they're looking at whether they can include in a lot of the beef information nucleus type of progeny tests which have been looked at by the different breed societies. The other bit of information uh, which does still feed into the analysis but has shown probably more recently not to be as useful as was first thought is um, the level of insulin growth like factor in the blood at weaning. So as you can see there on the photo, um, animals were just bled from, from the, the vein on the tail on a bit of blotting paper. That was sent off um, to, to a company called Prime Grow in the, the past and it measured the amount of this insulin growth like factor which is a hormone in the blood. Um, in the early work they, they showed that there was a very high correlation between um, the, the levels of IGF-1 and um, the actual net feed intake so it was shown that or hoped that this would be a really good indirect way of measuring the trait due to the limitations in, in the um, actually collecting the feed test information. Um, certainly uh, that's it come from the pig industry and, and that's what they've used with, with great success. Um, unfortunately it's shown that in, uh, well it might have worked well in a research type of sense when we started to, to collect information in a practical sense where there was a great range of production systems and um, time of recording and those type of things, the information wasn't that useful. Um, so it's, it still feeds in there but with a, a fairly low correlation, um, I think of around 0.1 uh, or 0.2. Um, but importantly it also has shown now to have a different relationship with the two traits. So uh, with one of the, the NFI um, either F or P, it's positively correlated, but with the other one, it's negatively correlated. So it, it's kind of of very limited use now, um, and nobody's collecting it. But it, it does still feed into the analysis. I guess one of the hopes with this IGF information is they're doing some further research to see whether it may be a good way of indirectly measuring some other traits relating to maybe some female fertility 
or some um, fat depth and those type of traits. But probably if you're interested in recording it feed intake at the moment, the only way you can record it is through the, the feed test stations. Um, and if, you, if you're looking at that, then my recommendation would be contact staff at breed plan to discuss recording because it is, is very cost inhibitive um, and you need to look at whether it's, it's possible to do. Uh, so Philip, that's my rundown of those couple of EBVs. Uh, I see we've got quite a few questions in, so I might um, pass back to you. Thanks Andrew. Yeah, a couple of questions there. Um, just in relation to structural soundness EBVs, um, can accredited structural assessors do their own animals? Uh, good, good question. I believe they can. I believe they can. Um, there'd be no reason at the moment if there are accredited assessors uh, that they couldn't send it in on their own animals. Um, I guess the, the next question then becomes how do I become accredited um, if I want to score my own animals? That's currently being looked at at the moment. Um, they are looking at what the different options are to both accredit people and then also maintain that accreditation. The, the initial way was there was um, similar to the scanning accreditation course for, for the carcass traits. There was a, an accreditation test set up um, and course run and, and that's been done uh, some years ago. They're now currently looking at what the options are moving forward. So there might be some further information about that circulated, I believe, towards the end of this year. Uh, but if you were interested in becoming accredited yourself, uh, then I'd contact someone at SPTS or TBTS for further information. Okay, thanks Andrew. Um, in relation to the net feed intake EBVs, um, question here is are feedlots paying any attention for net feed intake efficient or uh, favourable EBV animal uh, with, with bloodlines? Um, I'm not too sure in Australia. I think the, the main problem we've got is there aren't very many animals that have net feed intake EBVs available on them. Um, so I don't know if they're paying too much attention to the EBVs. What I think they are doing is they are starting to, to measure it in the feedlot on a, a kind of mob basis. Um, so they are collecting information on a mob basis and starting to relate that back to the vendor that they bought the cattle from and starting to deal more closely with those. So I, I think they are measuring it, saying to pay attention to it, but I don't believe they began to the level of, of looking at the net feed intake EBVs on the size of groups of animals or those type of things simply because we don't have enough animals with those EBVs available. Okay, thanks Andrew. Um, Oh, I guess another question there is how long does it take to get uh, NFI EBV uh, from when the data is recorded? Uh, if you're in the, the Angus and the Hereford breed where the, these EBVs are actually uh, reported at the moment, if you send that information in at the next group analysis, uh, so in the case of Angus there are, there are 12 group analyses run a year now, um, in the case of Hereford there are four, in the next group analysis the uh, trial net feed intake EBVs will be, will be updated and sent out to you. So it's just similar to, to the, the other traits, the weight traits. In breeds that haven't got that information, um, then it would really depend on waiting until there was sufficient information for the EBVs to be calculated. Um, there's no simple answer to that, uh, but once, once there was, other than once there is sufficient information calculated, then that we can run that software for that particular breed. Um, but again, if you're in that situation, then it's probably a matter of contacting SBTS or TBTS to discuss the specifics as to what would be required. Right, Andrew. Um, one more question there on uh, net, net feed intake. How many people are currently doing full feed net feed intake tests at the moment? Uh, I don't have any science behind my answer, but I'd effectively say none is my understanding. Um, the, there will be some um, that, that are going on, but not in the kind of levels that you, you will uh, require to generate the EBVs. As I said, the information which is really required, you're looking at progeny tests, um, so the, the, the breed information nucleus programs are starting to look at the feasibility of doing it. A lot of the breed societies have shown that they can't afford um, the, the cost of the testing 
so that they've gone away from it and now looking at other options, uh, whether other funding is available from, say, the, the feedlot industry and those type of things. I know the Angus Beef Information Nucleus, they have actually put it in, so we will start to see quite a bit coming out for the Angus breed. Um, but it, the other ones, unless it's in a research sense, um, I don't believe there are any kind of individual um, seed stock herds of num yeah, there'll be one or two isolated ones, but effectively there aren't many. Um, so you, s you certainly would be looking, I think, to get useful information at needing um, a kind of 10 to 15 minimum kind of progeny per size to really get useful information out of it. Okay, thanks. Andrew. Following on from that, it looks like you might have generated a bit of interest with the uh, net feed intake. Measurements is someone asking here. How do we get hold of one of those automated feed dispensers that we've uh, put up in the in the presentation? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure what process you'd, you'd need to follow. Um, what I'll do for you, John, though, is I'll I'll find out an answer and and get it back to you. Um, I, I, there are I know a couple of studs which did set up the those kind of feed test stations originally when, when this was all kind of um, first coming about in I think the, the early 2000s. Um, what process you need to go now, um, I'm not 100% sure if you're looking at trying to set it up on farm yourself. Um, certainly the, 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 there are a number of research stations, a couple in each state or um, that, that have them set up uh, which you can look at sending animals into but on farm I'd have to provide further information for you. Right, thanks Andrew. Look, I think we might um, pull it up there with the question, so if you'd like to, to continue on. Okay, so the, the last thing we need to cover, having looked at some of those newer EBVs, is kind of the next phase of breed plan technology is really looking at including um, the information from DNA tests into breed plans. So this is kind of the, the next generation. Um, if you, you see on my diagram there, where we currently sit is, is indicated by the, the green boxes. Um, so when we're looking at the EBV calculation, it's taking into account you know, pedigree information, uh, direct performance measures for, for those traits, plus any performance which may be available um, on the correlated traits. So it's taking information, you know, basically uh, account of all that information to come up with the calculation of the animal's estimated breeding value. What has now been done, um, and there are enhancements that have been made to the breed plan software to facilitate the inclusion of the DNA information into the uh, breed plan analysis, so that you will have basically marker-assisted EBVs or EBVs calculated, which take into account not only the pedigree information, performance information, the performance on correlated traits, but also the DNA information, so that we're coming up with the EBVs of the highest possible accuracy uh, for the information that's available for those particular traits. Um, I guess how it's going to feed in is kind of indicated by that diagram. Um, for, for those that are more technically minded, it's effectively modelled into the analysis as a correlated trait. So um, they'll, they'll look at a, a set of animals which uh, have the, the DNA information, look at the correlation between the, the DNA results and either the animal's, e or the animal's EBVs for that trait or performance measures for that trait ideally, look at the correlation between those and feed that into the analysis based on that, that particular correlation which they find. So um, I, I think if we, we look there at what loading does the DNA have relative to the current measurements, that's, that's a question which just came in, it will depend on the correlation. So um, if the, the test has been shown to be very useful and we've got a very high correlation, then it will have a, a high weighting and contribute a, a lot to the accuracy of the EBVs. If it's shown to, to not be of much information, then it'll have... Um, yeah, less impact on the EBVs and will reflect more, or the EBV will reflect more of the performance information that has been calculated. Um, I'll show you some, some examples as to what effect it has on the EBV in, in a slide or two. So the, the first EBVs that have got marker assisted or DNA information in them were released in October 2008 for the Brahmin breed. And as we've previously discussed, these are the, the trial shear force EBVs, which uh, take into account a, a set, several bits of information. 
So um, we look here on this diagram, a bit of an updated diagram to the one on the previous page. We've got the pedigree information, we've got the shear force measurements, so the, the direct measurements for that particular trait. We've also got some flight time records, which is a, an indirect measure uh, of the meat tenderness, plus also the Pfizer tenderness stars and um, molecular value predictions. That's all feeding in and uh, coming up with the calculation of these EBVs for shear force or, or meat tenderness. Now, to give you an idea, this is a, a practical idea as to how much the DNA information is calculating to, to the EBV or contributing to the EBV. This slide here is actually looking when we were looking at the stars, so when there were only four markers available for tenderness. It doesn't take into account uh, the MVPs for, for tenderness that, that are now available, and also doesn't, I guess, look at the, the Angus um, where we've now got the 50K or the, the uh, MVPs based on the, the 50K panel. Um, so if you look here at, at, at what we're talking about, if we just had a, a flight time measurement on an animal, um, then you would expect accuracies of around 15%. So EBVs with accuracy around 15% for the trial shear force EBVs. Um, obviously, we, the, we can't have their own shear force measurement um, in the case of size. So if we've got, oh, sorry, it's, it's, sorry, we do down here. So for, for the animals that um, had actually been killed, so the steers, if they've got their own shear force measurement, then we'd come up with an EBV with an accuracy of around 55% or 52%. Um, if they've just got the DNA information available, um, as is indicated by the second bar graph, then I think they came up with an accuracy of 28%. So that just gives you an idea, I suppose, as to in isolation, if we just had the, those three bits of information available, um, then what their different usefulness of, to the breed plan analysis. With flight time, it's got a correlation there of uh, giving around 15% accuracy. The DNA information is giving you about 28, but then if we've got a direct measure of the trait, uh, then it's giving you in the, the low 50s. Um, in terms of the, the case, I suppose, with DNA, that we don't have, well, the benefit of progeny testing isn't the same for our other performance traits because we're getting the animal's own markers, then we're actually getting a direct measure of their genetics. So if you had 20 progeny with the, the DNA markers available, then the accuracy comes back a bit. So it's around 25%. Um, and you certainly don't get any added bonus um, if you've got the animal's own DNA result plus um, DNA results on the progeny because the, the, the animal's own information is what we're talking about. Um, if you then get the situation where you've got the animal's own shear force measurements, so plus they've got the DNA information, you can see this is an indication of the kind of extra accuracy that you will see in the EBVs. So it moves from, from low 50s to, to the kind of high 50s. So if they've got their own shear force measurement, direct measure of the trait, then it, it doesn't actually contribute that much extra accuracy to the EBV having the four markers available. Um, if we move down to, to the bottom two, if you've got the 20 progeny that have got shear force measurements, then you expect to have the, the accuracies up in the, the high 70s. So saying to progeny test size for, for shear force, then we start to get some reasonable accuracies for these EBVs. Um, and there you can see if we, the animal's been progeny tested and then we've suddenly got a flight time measurement plus markers on 20 of those progeny, then it really contributes very negligible kind of extra accuracy. Now, this here is, I, sh I should point out, is just looking at an example of the, the shear force EBVs for Brahman and looking at the four markers. Those graphs will completely change um, if we start looking at different DNA information, uh, different traits, and we start looking at the different relativity of the, the usefulness of the actual direct measures of the, the traits, direct performance measures, the usefulness of, of the kind of correlated performance measures, and the useful differences in the usefulness of the actual DNA markers. Um, and certainly I know they're, they're looking at the moment at trying to include the information from the, the 50K, the, the latest test for, for Angus, into the Angus read plan analysis um, and are showing some quite useful results from what I understand. So you would expect to see, or what I'm expecting to see is um, more contribution from the DNA information to the accuracy of the EBVs than what we've seen in the Brahma tenderness in the past. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a guide there, I guess, to, to how the DNA information is coming in. Um, it's effectively going to be modelled as a correlated trait 
go into the analysis um, with all the available both uh, pedigree information plus performance information to come up with the highest accuracy estimate of the animal's breeding value that's available. And it, we, there was a recent meeting, I guess, in, in Armadale of kind of uh, people who are working in extension and, and research for both the beef, um, sheep and dairy industries and the, the topic of that discussion was, well, how are we going to get the most out of this DNA information and the I think, unanimous outcome was by combining it, certainly in the short to, to medium term, combining the DNA information with the performance information, such as, as through uh, the breed plan analysis, or in the case of sheep, the, the Sheep Genetics Australia analysis, uh, to come up with these marker assisted EBVs, which are of the highest accuracy possible. Uh, so, Philip, I might pass back to you now. I think there's a, a few questions that have come in. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, just in relation to the, the marker assisted EBVs, uh, within a breed, can you compare an, EB, an EBV to a marker assisted EBV? Correct. Yes. So if, um, and they, this is where we, at the moment, they're just being called marker assisted EBVs, um, just to indicate that, that some DNA information will come in there. For a particular trait, though, in, in the time, they, they will be, or they are now directly compared uh, whether there's DNA information included in them or not. So if, if you've got just shear force EBVs that are based just off shear force measurements versus shear force EBVs with some DNA and some shear force, then they are directly comparable. Okay, another question there, Andrew, is uh, why are these DNA tests being incorporated uh, with the, with the breed plane EBVs if they have not been validated? Good question, um, and, and certainly the answer is they won't be included in the breed plan analysis unless they have been validated. Um, so the, the correlations which have been given for those, you know, being used in the, the shear force EBVs at the moment are all based off information which has been collected in the beef CRC, so an independent group of cattle. Um, of that particular breed and it will look at the, the usefulness of that test um, in displaying differences in the genetic merit of animals in that particular breed for that particular trait. So um, that they will need to be independently validated um, and at this stage that that will be by AGBU, uh, so that the, the Animal Genetics and Breeding Union Armadale and once there is that independent validation information available in that breed then that information will be included into the breed plan analysis with the relevant correlations. Right, well, thanks Andrew. Um, uh, that's about all the questions there that we have. Um, there's a few other comments, but um, I think they probably could be taken up with the individuals involved. Um, let's add anything else to add, Andrew. I think we'll probably wrap up tonight's presentation. Okay, thank you, Philip. The only thing I will add is just to, to thank everyone for their attendance. Obviously, we, we've been through the, the six weeks um, and hopefully we, we've covered a, a range of different um, information, so I, I hope it's of use to you, but um, I'll, I'll let you wrap up, Philip, but I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, coming through this, this first webinar course which we've run. Right, thanks, Andrew. Um, just a reminder before we do finish, um, all of our webinars are available for, for viewing from the SBTS and TBTS websites. Um, so if you are experiencing any difficulties accessing these, um, please contact, contact us and we can look at other options of getting that information to you. Uh, we will be providing a link to written resource material that is relevant to the trades discussed tonight and that will be emailed out to you um, over the next couple of days. Uh, if you haven't been able to answer your questions tonight um, or if there's anything that you would like more information on uh, about any of the topics that we have discussed throughout this, this webinar course, please feel free to contact the technical officer for your breed which will, will come up on the, um, the screen at the end of the presentation. Um, but once again, on behalf of Andrew and myself, thank you for your attendance tonight and all the very best with your performance recording. And good night for now.